and an eagle. The old man was a na- man named Gordius. Maybe you've heard of him. Kind of an odd name. And one day, Gordius was tilling his field when an eagle came and landed on the yoke of his plow. Now, Gordius lived in ancient, uh, uh, ancient Greece, and so he knew exactly what this eagle was. This was the holy bird of Zeus. And it was just an astonishing sight to Gordius, and he knew he'd have to go to the next city where he knew there was a group of prophets there who could interpret this sign. And so he went to this village, and as he neared, he found a woman that was there who was drawing water at the well. And she, so he asked this woman, he says, do you know where there are prophets? I need them to interpret a sign. And he told her what had happened. An eagle came and landed on my plow. And she said, I know what you need to do. You need to go back to where the eagle landed on your plow, and you need to offer up a sacrifice to Zeus. And the old man says, that sounds about right, but I don't know how to do that. Would you come with me and offer the sacrifice for me? And the woman agreed and followed Gordius back to his farm and helped him to offer the sacrifice to Zeus. And then she ended up falling in love with him and staying to be his wife. And Gordius and this woman eventually had a kid named Midas. Maybe you've heard of Midas before. Midas grew into a handsome man and he'd heard about a land nearby called Phrygia. And Midas knew that there was strife in Phrygia, but he also had heard of this ancient prophecy in the land of Phrygia that one day a savior would come, one day a king would come and bring peace to Phrygia, and this king would be riding on a wagon. And so Midas got in his father's wagon and he rode it into Phrygia, and when they saw Midas riding in, they made him king. It was just that simple, just that easy. And soon Midas did. He brought peace to the land of Phrygia. And he took his father's wagon that had become a sign in this prophecy. He took the wagon, he took it into the temple of Zeus, and he left it there as an offering to the, for the gods' favor. Years passed, and Midas died, and kings came after him. And soon there was a whole legend that came about that had to do with this wagon that was sitting in the middle of this temple of Zeus. And the story began to develop, a a legend grew about the knot that held the wagon to the yoke. It was this big knot, and it was wound together using bark from a tree, and you could never even find the end to this knot. It just looked like one big ball of twisted up rope with no end that held the wagon to the yoke. And a legend grew about this wagon, And the legend went like this, whoever could undo the knot that tied the wagon to the yoke, whoever could undo it would become a king that would rule all of Asia. Have you heard this story before? Would rule all of Asia. Fast forward a few years, a man by the name of Alexander the Great came about. And he grew up sitting in the gardens of Midas. He was very familiar with the story of the Gordian knot. And the king, when Alexander became king, he could not resist the chance to go and see this famous wagon and try his hand at untying the knot. And so Alexander goes, and word began to spread that Alexander was coming and was going to try to undo the knot. And a crowd began to gather in the temple of Zeus, and all of them are standing by when Alexander enters into the temple ready to try his hand at the knot. And this, the temple goes silent. Everybody is watching to see what Alexander may do. And he begins to inspect the knot. And just like everybody else before him, it was clear there was nowhere to start. There was no end to begin untying. And the king's men were gathered there, and they began to worry. Is Alexander the Great going to embarrass himself in front of all these people by not being able to untie the knot? And soon after looking at it after a while, Alexander stepped back and he drew a sword. This is my sword. It's a tiny one. It's fine. He drew a sword and he sent it down on the knot and cut the knot in half and it fell into two halves onto the floor. And Alexander said, the knot has to be undone, but nobody said how it has to be undone. And that night, there was a great storm of thunder and lightning in the heavens. Kind of an interesting story, isn't it? 
This is an age-old story. This story has been along, around for a long, long time. And if you know anything about the rule of Alexander the Great, you, knew, you know that he came to rule large portions of the world. But Greece came and went, and eventually Greece was conquered by the Roman Republic. But there's something really interesting about when Rome came and conquered Greece is that while Greece no longer had political independence, Greek culture and Greek philosophy and Greek art heavily influenced Roman culture and Roman society as a whole. So a lot of the times when we talk about Rome, we talk about Greek and Rome together. We call it Greco-Roman. I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus actually grew up in a Greco-Roman culture. Jesus grew up, and when Jesus was growing up, this story of Alexander the Great cutting the knot in half would have been around for around like 300 years. It would have been a story that a lot of people knew in Jesus' day. And it had probably been told and retold and retold over the centuries that it went from being historical fact to growing into legend. Just as how now in America we tell stories about the founding fathers who lived like 300 years years ago, and some of the stories about even the founding fathers have become more legend than truth. Have you ever heard that story of George Washington, who can never tell a lie? It's not true. It's a legend. It has no basis in fact, but we do it too, and the same thing happened with Alexander the Great. And what we really learn from these stories is that they're not necessarily supposed to be historical fact, these stories about George Washington never telling a lie, and Alexander the Great cutting the knot in half, when these stories move into legend territory and become less about the facts, they're meant to teach us something. They're meant to tell us what exactly our country holds dear, what exactly we value most. And so keeping that in mind, when you hear this story about Alexander the Great taking out a sword and cutting the knot in half, what does that tell you about what Greek and uh, subsequently Rome What does that tell you about what they held dear? What does that tell you about what they thought was important? What does that tell you about what they felt were good values to have? Well, it's pretty clear. It sounds like Greece and Rome, they valued power, they valued glory, they valued pride, they valued might. They valued Alexander the Great taking up a sword and cutting the knot in halves. They value people that solve problems with a sword and with war and with violence rather than someone who solves it with wisdom or with humility. This morning, we're going to be reading a letter. And this letter was written to a church who was feeling the strain of the Greco-Roman culture around them. In fact, I, I would venture to guess there were some people in the church who probably knew the story of the Gordian Knot and knew the story of Alexander the Great, because it seems like they valued the very same things that Alexander the Great valued and the people who told that story and retold that story valued. These are people in the church, and it seems like they valued power and glory and might. They valued the fact that if there's a problem in the church, you solve it, not with quiet wisdom or with humility, but with the sword. The only way to make church work work is by taking what you want and grasping for influence and throwing your weight around. The only way the church can survive is someone takes charge of this mess by might and by power and by glory. Something was happening in the early church where it seemed like they were valuing all the things of the Greco-Roman culture around them, all the things that were influenced by the story of Alexander the Great. And then there's a man named Paul, and Paul isn't buying it. There may have been a time when Paul used to believe the Roman way, but now Paul is writing a letter and telling them about a better way to be the church, a better way to live together, and it's one that mirrors the person of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to be finishing up our sermon series entitled The Church As It Should Be. This has been a long series. Um, And we've been looking at scripture and looking at what scripture tells us the church should be and what the church should look like. And we're going to be finishing it up today in Philippians 2. Philippians 2. If you have your Bibles, flip there with me. Philippians 2. Paul is writing this to a group of uh, churches in 
the region of Philippi. And you'll remember that I said that I'm, I'm pretty sure that this church in Philippi was heavily influenced by the Greco-Roman culture around them of power and glory and might. And if you had any doubt of that fact, uh, you should know that the city of Philippi was actually named after Alexander the Great's dad, Philip. And so they definitely would have known the legends of Alexander the Great. There's no doubt they knew these stories. And it's kind of clear reading this letter that Paul wrote them that their location was rubbing off on them. Paul wrote this letter to address a few different issues in the church. It's, it's clear there were tensions in leadership. In fact, he goes so far as to call out two specific leaders in the church by name. Can you imagine if Paul wrote a letter to your church and called you out by name? That would be a scary, scary thing. He calls these people out by name. We don't quite know the specifics of what was going on in this church, but we can kind of look at what Paul is saying and what Paul is urging them to do and kind of work our way backwards to guess what the issues were that they were facing. And so let's read. This is in Philippians 2, uh, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to read eight verses. Philippians 2, it says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each, uh, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your, relationship with, uh, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by, coming, by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Just before this point in the letter, Paul's been talking about, a lot about suffering and how Paul and this church in Philippi were both undergoing suffering. And so Paul is urging the church, yes, we are experiencing suffering for the sake of the gospel, but Paul says, wow. Don't you experience encouragement in Jesus in the midst of your suffering? And Paul gets into some really good Trinitarian theology. He talks a lot about, he talks about the Trinity in this part of the, uh, the letter. He's telling the church, he's saying, in your suffering, haven't you found encouragement by being united with Christ? There's one person of the Holy Spirit. Haven't you found comfort in the Father's love? That's number two. And haven't you found a common sharing in the Spirit? There's the third person of the Trinity. And Paul says, if you found comfort in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the midst of the suffering that you're, you face, then please make me truly joyful by being the church that God has called you to be. And it's this line here, make me truly joyful, that really shows us Paul's pastoral heart. This is not Paul telling them, you better do it, and you better do it for me. But instead, what we see here is Paul cares so deeply for this church in Philippi and cares so deeply for the people that make up this church that he has tied his emotions to these Christians in the church that he cares deeply for. He says, make me joyful by doing this. Nothing would make me happier than is if you as the church would do a few things in light of your encouragement in Christ Jesus. And the big thing that he calls them to do that would make him really truly happy, he says, would you please be like-minded? Be like-minded. And maybe your translation says something a little bit differently. But I feel like being like-minded is a pretty good translation for what Paul is saying here. Literally what Paul is saying is set your minds on the same thing. Set your minds on the same thing. Here is what Paul is not saying. We can misunderstand what Paul is saying here. Here is what Paul is not saying. Paul uh, is not saying that you need to think the same thoughts as the per other person that you worship alongside. 
He is not saying that you need to agree on every little thing. And every board and committee in a church says, praise God. That would be a really hard thing to do. He's not saying think the same thought. He's not saying share the same opinions. He's not saying agree on everything. Paul is saying be like-minded. Literally what Paul is saying is share the same mindset. Share the same mindset. And if you think about what that means to have a certain mindset, mindsets don't so much have to do with our thoughts or with our opinions or what we think is best. But instead, your mindset is kind of the disposition that you take. It's your purpose. It's what you're directed towards. In fact, we talk about our mindset, but really, our mindset is something that captures our whole being. Everything that we are is pointed towards a single thing. It's everything that motivates us. It's all heading in the same direction. And Paul is saying, if you have the same mindset as everybody else, you might have different opinions. You might think differently from someone else. But you're all working towards the same thing. You're all heading in the same direction. You're all motivated by the same thing. You have the same mindset. I like to think about what Paul is talking about here with, uh, uh, with an illustration on blueprints. You know what blueprints are. Anytime you build something, you have to come up with the blueprints. And I just want you to imagine that maybe we have blueprints for a house that we want to build... But we, rather than just hiring one contractor, we hire 10 contractors. And we give them each the same set of blueprints and say, we would like you to build this house. I don't know a whole lot about this area or about this space, but my guess would be if you gave 10 different contractors the same exact blueprint, my, I would imagine you'd probably get 10 different opinions on how exactly to go about building this house. What do you think? You'd probably get uh, 10 different techniques that you could build, 10 different ways that you might be able to save money, 10 different ideas on how you can make this house that is on these blueprints a reality. And that's kind of getting at what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, church, each and every one of you needs to share the same mindset. You need to share the same set of blueprints. You might have different opinions. You might have different plans about how we can go about this whole thing. But you need to share the same mindset. You need to have the same goal. You need to be pointed at the same purpose. You might still disagree. You might not share the same opinions. But you all have the same mindset, the same set of blueprints. And Paul continues to flesh out what it looks like whenever you share the same blueprints. What if you had a church in which everybody had the same mindset and they all shared the same set of blueprints of what we're meant to do. We had the same love, we would have the same love, we would have the same spirit, we would be one of mind, we would find unity in a church like that, in which we're all pointed towards the same goal. We all want the same things. We all share the same mindset. But you might be asking, what exactly do these blueprints entail? What's written on there? What is this this disposition we're meant to have? What are we supposed to be pointed towards? Well, verse 5 tells us what's written on our blueprints. Paul tells the church very explicitly, be like-minded, have the same mindset, and here's the mindset that you're meant to have. Here's what is written on your blueprints. He says in verse 5, have the same mindset as who? As Jesus Christ, as Christ Jesus. Literally what that means is as King Jesus. So here's the blueprint. Church, we might not always agree on everything, but our whole being, everyone in our church should be, should be like-minded in this one thing. We should all share the mindset of Jesus Christ. And the more I read this letter, the more I begin to think that maybe it's possible that there were some Philippians who had been reading the wrong blueprints. It sounds as if there may have been one or two people or one or two leaders who had a completely different set of blueprints they were working off of. They did not have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. In fact, I would venture to say that maybe even they had blueprints that were following a completely different king. It wasn't the king that looked like Jesus, but it seems as if they had blueprints that followed a Greco-Roman type of king, a blueprint that looked a whole lot like the king Alexander 
the great. I think maybe in this church in Philippi, this church was having to figure out how to untie a Gordian knot of their own. Just like Alexander stood over the knot and was trying to figure out how the, what the best way would be to untie this knot, is it possible that this church in Philippi was trying to undo a knot of their own? But rather than it being a literal knot on a cart or on a wagon, maybe this knot was just called living together. And that can be pretty difficult sometimes, can it? How do we untie this knot called living together, being together, worshiping together, being a part of a community together? How do we untie that knot of living together? I think this is kind of an age-old question. It's not really something that is unique to this church in Philippi, but it's really a knot that every country and every culture and every community has to answer. If you're going to bring together a bunch of different people from different cultures and backgrounds and beliefs and pasts, we kind of all get tangled together in community, and we have to untie this Gordian knot, this question of how do we live together without tearing each other apart? How do you untie such a knot of living together when you can't even find the ends? It's clear, if you know your history that the Greeks and the Romans had their answer. How do you untie the Gordian knot of living together in a community under Greco-Roman rule? How do you do it? The same way Alexander the Great did it. You do it by the sword. The only way to live together is if you grasp for power and grasp for might and glory. It takes smart leadership. It takes puffing yourselves up. It means that you better take what you want and you better get it now or else someone else is going to take it from you. It means grasping for influence at every chance you can take. This is how you untie the knot of living together. It's by the sword. It's what Alexander the Great taught us. And if you don't believe me, you can think about even the story of Jesus himself. This is the culture that Jesus lived in and we see this played out in his life. He lived under a Roman rule, and the Jews in that day were getting all riled up because of what Jesus was doing and what he was teaching, and there was pressure and there was strain, and this knot began to develop between Jesus and the Jewish people. And so what do the Jewish people do? They come to Rome, they say, Rome, help us untie this knot. And how did Rome see fit to untie the knot? With the sword. We'll put him on a cross, we'll break his legs, we'll pierce his side, and we'll leave him to die. This is how Greece and Rome solve their problems. This is how they live together. We have to live together, so the only way to solve this knot is with power. Push down dissent, take control, lead by the sword. So could it be... That as the Philippians were trying to solve this Gordian knot of sorts of their own, of living together as this new thing called the church, they remembered that their city was named after Alexander the Great's dad, and they knew what Greece held uh, to be true and what held to be important. And they said, this is how we need to be the church. Someone needs to take power. Someone needs to take control. If you want something, you got to seize it. And you think, man, Jaron, you're getting a whole lot from this passage that I'm not seeing. Remember how I said we kind of have to work ourselves backwards. We don't really quite know what this church was struggling with, but we do know what Paul told them. And I don't know that Paul would tell them something if it wasn't something they were struggling with. And so as I read this story, I was kind of holding Alexander the Great's story in my mind. And I see Alexander the Great who has this selfish ambition that drives him to Phrygia to try his hand at the knot. Take what you want. You want to be king of Asia? Cut the knot in half. Then I hear Paul's words. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Sounds pretty radical. Sounds like the complete opposite. But Alexander shows us what it means to have pride. Believe in who you are. That you can make things happen. No one else can solve that knot, but you can. So many have tried and have failed, but I will do it. I will take control. And if I can't solve it, I'll force it through. And then you read Paul's letter in which he tells the church, do nothing 
out of vain conceit. And you think about Alexander grasping for power. He had heard the story all of his childhood. Whoever would cut the knot can be king of all of Asia. If you see time to grab power in the church, make your play. Take out your sword. Grasp for power and hang on for dear life. But then you hear Paul saying, share King Jesus' mindset. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Seems like Paul might be telling the church that they were living by the wrong blueprint, trying to untie the knot of living together like a Greco-Roman would, like Alexander would. And he's trying to teach them, here is how we untie the knot of living together as followers of Jesus. And what what does Paul say? It's very simple. We untie the knot of living together, because we do have to live together. We are called to be a part of the community. How do we do it? How do we untie the knot that will inevitably tangle us up? Paul says we untie the knot of living together by having the mindset of Jesus. And he fleshes out what this means. What does it mean to have the mindset of Jesus? It's by showing love through humble service. This is the blueprint of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you this morning, if you don't know it already, can I tell you that Jesus loves you? I'm not saying that in like a Sunday school type of way. I really truly mean it. Jesus does love you. And there's something really important to understand about Jesus is Jesus didn't just tell you that he loved you. He didn't just put it down in a book that you can read about to know that Jesus does love you. But can I tell you that Jesus showed that he loved you by humbly serving his father and serving you. And that humble service took him all the way to the cross where he died on a Roman cross. Paul puts it like this. Jesus humbled himself, taking on the nature of a servant, and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus loved you, but he showed you that he loved you. And he did it through humble service. And it took him all the way to his death. That's good news, right? I'm excited about that. But it's also a little bit scary, and it's scary because I'm reading Paul, and it seems like Paul says, okay, now as a person, as a follower of Jesus, as a part of a church, you have to have the same mindset as Jesus. That's where it gets a little bit hairy. We talk a lot about love in the church. We talk about loving one another. We talk about being bound up in unity and in love, and isn't that great? Isn't that grand? Can I tell you that all of that talk of love that happens in the church is totally pointless and totally fake if it doesn't show itself in service? Because this is how love presents itself. Love always presents itself in humble service. Show me a husband who truly loves his wife, and I will show you all of the many ways in which he humbly serves her day after day after day. And if he doesn't do that, I would say, bro, do you really love your wife? And you can show me a wife who claims to truly love her husband, and I will show you all the many ways in which she humbly serves her husband without ever asking for a thank you in return. And if she's not doing that, I would say, sister, do you love your husband? Show me a parent, show me an uncle, show me an aunt who says, I love the kids in my life. Show me a grandparent who says, I love my grandkids. And I will show you all the many ways in which they humbly serve the children in their life. All the many dirty diapers that were changed without so much of a thank you from that baby. Why do we do it? We humbly serve because we love our kids. Show me a person who claims to love God. And I'll show you the many, many ways they humbly serve their God without ever asking for recognition. And show me a person who says, man, I love my church. Man, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ who surround me in my church. And I will show you a person who humbly serves their brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what love looks like. This is what it looks like to share the same mindset as Jesus. It's love, absolutely. But that love presents itself in humble service just as Jesus humbly served the world. Pastor, what, is, what do you mean by humble service? Paul defines it for us. 
Paul puts it like this. Look not to your own concerns, but to the concerns of others. This is what humble service looks like. And so what does this mean? It means that as the church, we untie the knot of living together by sharing the same mindset of Jesus, by showing love through humble service. This goes through for any community that you're a part of. You are a follower of Christ, and so you live together with other people differently. This goes for the church, absolutely, but this goes for your family as too. Did you know that marriages, Christian marriages are supposed to look differently than worldly marriages? Why? Because Christian marriages show love through humble service. Worldly marriages, who knows what they do, but Christians show love differently. Can I tell you, Christian parents show love differently than worldly parents. Why? Because we love our kids and we show that by humble service. Did you know Christians make really, really good college roommates? You want to know why? Because other people can't figure it out, but it should be, the, the way it should be is that Christians know, if I want to show that I love my roommate at college, I'm going to humbly serve them and put their needs first. You know what? You should want as many Christians in your city as possible because they love by showing humble service. Anytime people are living in community get together, a Gordian knot of sorts needs to be untied to make sure an explosion doesn't happen. And everyone claims they know how to solve it, and everyone claims they know how it's supposed to be done. And I'll tell you how the world thinks it should be done, because it sounds a lot like the way Alexander thought it should be done. But the church has always said something different. We as followers of Christ, we live in the communities that we live in differently. We show love to others. We don't just say it. We show it through humble service. This is how we live together in the church and elsewhere. We share the mindset of Jesus. We love each other, so we humbly serve as Jesus did. I've had family members <clears throat> ask me. It was a time of transition. They wanted to try out. They, they, couldn't, they were having to leave their current church, and were looking for a different church. And they said, where should we try to find a church? How do we know we found the right church? And why I told them, I said, I, you know, to be honest with you, I don't, even, I don't care if you go to a Nazarene church. I just want you to find a church where two things are true. I want you to find a church where it feels like family and a place where you can get plugged in. If you, if you are going to a church that professes Orthodox Christianity and those two things are true, your brother, is, who is a pastor, is cool with it. I'm good with it. What about the worship? Don't care, I don't care about the worship. Don't we need to find a place where they kind of sing the song? No. What about, should we look for a really good pastor, the one who preaches really good? I don't care if he preaches for 45 minutes and it's all just droning nonsense. What about the program? Shouldn't we look for good, don't worry about the programs. All of those things, worship, programs, pastors, sermons, all secondary. Find a place that feels like family and find a place where you can get plugged in. I didn't realize at the time when I gave that advice to my family member, but I was kind of telling the same thing, telling them the same thing that Paul is telling the church here. Find a place where you're filled with love for your brothers and sisters in the church, and then find a way that you can humbly serve your brothers and sisters in the church. Find a place that feels like family. Find a place where you can get plugged in. When Annie and I were in at Trevecca in Nashville, we wanted to find a church that we could get plugged in. Both of us had grown up and were raised in such a way that we knew you never just attend a church. We wanted to find a place that we could get plugged in. And we found a little church that no other college kids were going to because they did not sing the correct music. We were the youngest people there by far, but they treated us like family. And the very first Sunday we were there, they invited us over to their house and they fed us really good food. And as college kids, that's a blessing. And they really needed a drummer because they didn't have one. They really needed a good singer because they didn't have one. And we were able to serve them at church. And I got, I'll be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't find the pastor's service to be very compelling. And the worship certainly wasn't the type of music that I necessarily wanted to listen to. But Annie and I loved that church to death. And it felt like home. And I pray that we were able to love them well through our humble service. And so can I tell you the very same thing that I told my family and that Annie and I have found to be true? Can I ask you kind of a difficult question? As you look around this room, do you love us? Do you love us? Do you love your church? 
Whenever you look around this room, do you just see people that you worship with, or do you truly see brothers and sisters? Do you look around and do you see a faith family? I pray that's the case. And can I tell you, just like any other family, we ain't perfect. Every family has the weird family member. Every family has the crazy uncle, and we have it here. And every family has those weird traditions that we do every single year, and we don't really know why. We have those too. And if you feel like, man, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find the perfect church family, I'm going to tell you today, you ain't going to find it. No such thing exists. Every church family has their quirks, just like every family has their quirks. So I'm not asking if we're perfect. I'm asking you, do you love us? If you say, yes, I love my church, yes, I love my brothers and sisters, yes, I love you, can I ask you to show us that you love us? I'm not going to give a plea for all the needs in our church. I'm not going to shame you into serving. I'm just going to ask you, if you love us, would you show us? Do you love our teens? Prove it. Do you love our children? Show them that you love them. Do you love those people that can't attend with us because they're so sick? They live in nursing homes across town. Do you love them? Are you going to show them? How do we show them? Through humble service. And I tell you, there's a very important part of that word. Humble service. Can I tell you, if you're interested in serving in our church, but you ain't going to do it humbly, please don't put the card in the box. Please do not put the card in the box. Paul calls us to humble service. I've been in a lot of churches throughout my life, and I've met a lot of people who claim to serve their church, but they've typically served this way in their church rather than humble service. I have seen people take the sword into the sound booth and serve as the sound technician. We don't need people like that. And Corbin does a great job. I'm not, this is not Corbin. I'm not talking about him. I've seen it happen, though. They grasp for power. They throw their weight around. And they say, I serve my church. If you're not going to serve your church humbly, then it's not love. It's a power trip. And we don't want it. What do we need? I need people that love our church and who want to show it and who show it humbly. Last thing. Last thing. I've heard a lot of people ask, who've asked me and I know have asked you, I see questions come up on Owen County Chatter all the time, and you guys are always faithful in answering these questions. But I've, I've read these online and heard it different ways. People say, I'm looking for a church to attend. Where do you attend? And I see like all these Spencer Naz people commenting and saying, come to my church. I love it. It's great. But I've always thought about, I've always thought that is very peculiar and very It's very unique to our Western modern culture to ask the question that way. Where do you attend church? What church do you attend? Well, I attend this church, or I attend that church, or I'm looking for a church to attend. Can I tell you, attending a church is is not found anywhere in Scripture. And if you talk to someone who wrote a letter in Scripture and you're able to go back in time and talk about attending a church, they would look at you like you were crazy. What do you mean attend a church? Well, I go to the church, and we put our kids in Sunday school, we listen to the sermon, we do the programs, and then we come home, and we take a nap. What? And then, But we found out we didn't really like that church, so we started attending a different church because they seemed to serve us better, and the sermons were more interesting. And Paul and James and Peter would say, what? Attend a church? Paul would say, oh, oh, do you mean, are you talking... You're supposed to be a part of a church. You're talking about attending. That is not a thing. What Paul calls us to is be a part of a church. In fact, Paul believes this so, so, uh, so highly. He says, be a part of the body of Christ. Can I tell you, please find a church to be a part of. Do you know what you attend? You attend plays. You attend plays where you can sit on the sidelines and watch the play, and you can leave and say, that was a good play, that was a bad play. We probably won't see that one again. We're going to try a different one next time. You attend a play. You're a part of a family. You cannot attend a family. You can only be a part of one. But here's what makes it difficult, is whenever you're attending a play, you have no buy-in. 
You can just sit there and enjoy and leave and go home. But if you're a part of a family, you have to show how you love. You have responsibilities. Man, I don't want anybody going around town saying, I attend Spencer first. I would, my heart would be full if we had a lot of people who said, I'm a part of Spencer First Church of Nazarene. They are my family. And Paul's desire and my honest desire as your pastor is that you would love us like family and that you would show us that you love us through humble service. Because it's the only way this community called the church can work is if we have people who are humbly serving. And so, listen, I'm not going to come and hunt you down if you're attending I'm not going to cross-check all the cards in the box and see who's actually keeps coming and isn't serving and come hunt you down. I'm not going to do it. We're still going to love you like family, even if you are just attending. But if you love us, would you show us? Would you find out what it means to humbly serve as a part of a church? Would you pray with me? Dear Holy Father, I'm so thankful to be a part of such a wonderful church family And if there's one thing that Annie and I have said ever since we've come to Spencer First is that it feels like home. And we truly believe, we truly feel as if this is our family. So many adopted aunts and uncles to our kids and adopted grandparents to our children. This is our family. And Lord, my prayer, my honest prayer for this church is that we could invite more family members into the fold. People who feel like this is a place they can walk home. People who find brothers and sisters that they love. But Lord, may we be a church who doesn't grasp for power. May we be a church who doesn't uh, untie the Gordian knot of living together with power and with influence. But instead, Lord, may we be a church in which every family member shows our love by humbly serving their other parts. We love you, God. We thank you. We ask all of this in your name and all God's people said, amen. I want to remind you, if you feel so led, you can fill out those cards. They'll be here over the next couple of weeks, so if you don't get to it this week, you can do it another week. Um, and if you look at the card and you say, man, I want, to, I want to serve in some way, but nothing on this card fits with my schedule, or it's just impossible for me to serve in any of these ways, I find that really hard to believe. But I really would love to talk to you. Let's figure out a way that you can serve in our church. There's a, there's a portion, there are ladies who meet every single week and pray in a, stair, in, in a room upstairs at a certain time, and let me tell you, that is a gift to our church, and that is absolutely a valid form of service, and prayer warriors are on there, so if you want to if you want a place to serve, be a prayer warrior. We have prayer services you can be a part of. It doesn't mean you have to do things physical all the time. It doesn't mean you have to teach a class. Uh, sometimes just things like that are ways that you can serve, so there's things like that on there. Uh, Just check it out. So don't write it off really quickly, but uh, I've spoken enough. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to read a benediction over you today. Benediction says this. If you're looking for a family, I pray that you would find it here. And if you're looking to be loved and to love, I pray that you would find it here. And if you're looking for a place to serve, I pray that you might find it here. I want to remind you, this is just one small church in the universal church. And may we always pray and strive that our church is as it should be. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next week.